to Egypt and made a very in-depth study of Egyptian <coughs> law and symbolism. And uh, he gave a series here a while back called Hermetic Egypt Through Quantum Eyes. Uh, Les has a wonderful labyrinth in his gallery. And uh, it, it's still open. Is it by, by request? If you would like to go and see it, and it's tremendously worthwhile, you'll get a whole history of man if represented in art. And uh, it is unique. All right. Yes. This is all costume. This was uh, oh, this was the uh, on my key at the it says on the back Nile Hilton. So for one dollar you could buy it. So people were steering them, the, so they thought they'd give them away give them away for a dollar. So I've been trying to get it to hang on here, but it just wouldn't go. So tonight it's. Uh, Nice to be back. I haven't been back for a year. And uh, what I'm going to try to touch on tonight, touch on, I hope I don't bury you in it, but it's pretty heavy. And the, the more I work on it, I had planned and I agreed with Mary that I would speak extemporaneously. But I got so heavily into it that it, it, it just wouldn't work. So I'm going to try to read it intelligible. Um, so I'm going to start off with the, the prime fact. Number is all, cried Pythagoras. All nature forces, all nature's forces contain numbers that determine their strength and range. It may be that one day we shall have a theory that explains these numbers in terms of a fundamental idea. That's Paul Davis, physicist, in his book, God and the New Physics. How things began was not with the Egyptians the matter of a traditional tale, but a challenge to their imagination and understanding of the world. They manipulated the symbols of their myths to express their growing and earnest concern with major problems of existence, the working of God as spirit, and intelligence, the moral and natural order, the metaphysical questions that have perplexed men through history. That is by R.T. Rundle Clark in his Myths, Symbols in Ancient Egypt. Once, indeed, the scientists decided to exclude theology, politics, ethics, and current events from the sphere of their discussions, they were welcomed by the heads of state. You're watching the house. This remains of the black marks against strict scientific orthodoxy. Indifference to moral and political concerns. I've lost the author, but it's from the myths of the machine, the Pentagon of power. And now, first came the ram, second the bull, and third, the heavenly twins, then fourth, the crab, wherein the fifth, the lion shines. Sixth is the virgin, while the scale is the seven. The scorpion is eight, the archer nine, and the seagoat the ten. The boy that bears Zeus' water cup is eleven, the first and last, the fish with glistening tail. And I'd like to read from the microcosm, just microcosm by George Gilder. His opening part is part one, the overthrow of matter. I'd like to read a little bit. The central event of the 20th century is the overthrow of matter. The powers of mind are everywhere ascendant over brute force of things. This chance, this change marks a great historic divide impelled by an accelerating surge of innovation 
This trend will transform man's relations with nature in the 21st century. This overthrow of matter will reach beyond technology. It is understandable that humans resist the microcosm and even rebel against it. Quantum theory is an abstruse and difficult set of ideas. It baffles many of its leading exponents and it perplexed Albert Einstein to his grave. Quantum theory simply does not make sense. The reason the new physics does not make sense to most humans, however, is that prevailing common sense is wrong. Common sense serves the materialist superstition, the belief that we live in a world of solid phenomena, mechanically interconnected in chains of cause and effect. The common wisdom of mankind has yet to absorb the simple truth that in proportion to the size of its nucleus, the average atom in one of our cherished solids is as empty as the solar system. In various grudging ways, physical scientists all recognize this overthrow of matter. A key reason, and this is the factor that I had to deal with in preparing this tonight, a key reason that quantum theory is so difficult to understand, so apparently riddled with paradox, is this continued use of the vocabulary of materialism to discuss phenomena that in the usual sense lack all material qualities, such as solidity, location, continuity, and inertia. And that's where I'd like to begin. So the title is Dwellers on the 13th Floor, a Grand Grand Symbolique. Most religions have a name for it. The Bible calls it creation, while modern science calls it the Big Bang. The ancient Egyptians qualified it as the rupture of the perfection of the absolute. I personally relate the whole shtick to precisely what has brought us together this evening. Dwellers on the 13th Floor. What's that? Well, it's difficult. We must hold in mind as we near the end of the 20th century that man, as a consciously aware entity, entered the 20th century disenfranchised. The scientific method vehemently postulated that consciousness had absolutely nothing at all to do with science, at least not with classical physics. One of the classic philosophical names for that stance is logical positivism, and it is still rampant today. If you doubt my statement, pick up any issue of Online Magazine or the Skeptical Inquirer. Do you mind my reading this? No. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Thank you. <laughs> to me, that stance is ominous. The simple explanation <coughs> for this rests with classical physics once absolute certainty that the observer, man, must be completely removed from what is observed. To the extent that a steel wall was and still is metaphorically erected between the two opposites. The observer is the positive, while the observed, uh, the observed is the positive, while the observer is the negative. They refuse to accept that this is wrong. As mankind moved through this century, it became increasingly evident that quite the opposite is the case. What is observed is but a virtual mass of a particle of particles. Actually, what is observed, what is observer, is a projected illusion, for there is only the wave. Now, in reality, there is only in reality there there is only there is only what. The best answer that is emerging is reality can best be expressed as existing in some high super implicate order of a holistic cosmic consciousness that is ever present. This brings us back to Dwellers on the 13th Floor at Grand Sibeli. The title I gave to the book I am preparing brought to be produced charts in an attempt to try and explain the 12 houses of the Jodiac. 
which I attempted to define around what historians love to call the great, the great company of the gods, the Netaru. Netaru is that word archaeological archaeological fundamentalists insist upon incorrectly translating as God's many. The word netter, the singular, and netteru, the plural, distinctively means principles and or functions of what constitutes reality, which lies ever present just beneath the surface of things. This reality is extremely shy and never responds but to the Enigmatic suggestions, flashes of insight, the unerric dreams. I remember reading of how Kafka viewed reality, consciousness hiding the truth. Many of the Netaru are identified by a specifically chosen anima or is it creature in nature that best exemplifies a specific characteristic to distinguish one principle or function from another. This is unknown or completely ignored by the fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalism of most historians. They appear to want it that way. Emphatically, that is just the way it is. Blind to the fact that they were highly civilized beyond our fondest, fondest ignorance, our ignorance. They blithely called these ancient Egyptians primitive and near barbaric animal worship. The Netter Mat, M A A T, is not here. This is the one I've sold out of, so I have 11 present. I'm sorry I sold Mat. I focused around Mat, who is, uh, is the principle for truth, while justice was her function. Mat's symbol was the peacock feather and the ruler of my seventh house. A very good place to start with Gematrium. Where number, letter, function, and principle conjoin in truth. The number seven and the seventh letter of the Greek alphabet is ETA, Eta, our H. Eta stands for Helios, the divine personification of the sun. Now, here again, we must go back to, we do not have the language. The language of materialism is inappropriate to try to speak of reality, which is non-local and yet ever present. So we are restricted and limited by 2,000 years of least, at least of our linear type of speaking. And it was very difficult for me to hear, I didn't want to get out Okay, the seventh house is symbolized by the only non-animalistic city in the zone, the scale. I contend that in Tumura, which means measure, but not the verb, but as the measure of all, Tumura contains the truth of what we are speaking, while the label ancient Egypt is but an accumulation of facts entombed in the annals of history. And further, Tamira implies that their priesthood understand, understood reality to be in mock and supremely non-local and self-atomic. In Tamira, science was hermetically sealed and they knew what what oh they knew what our scientists are just learning. Quantum reality is far too esoteric. All was understood to be symbol and the symbolic throughout the Nile Valley, and just one grand symbolic. For reality rested with the nether rule in the netherworld. Now, when you Carly, and all through tonight, we're going to take a word of the netherworld is the quantum field. And it's the non-local reality see which is the, uh, the great equation by the uh, physicist at CERN Switzerland. We'll get to that. Why, just why, were the vows and there were seven, that is mod, and the vows were silent and feminine, and spoken. 
Now, as to the nonsense that the secret Pentagon X-Files are being released, that they are being revealed to the public on television channel 45, they usually <coughs> executed, but they reveal nothing but more scam. Whenever and wherever the X becomes a symbol in any way for government, particularly revealing a secret, let's go to Gematria. The X is cheap, and the number 22, and it stands for chasm, chaos, and the very idea of the Christus, the real ideal man. Five, Pythagorean brotherhood, love, pentagram, and pentagon x file. Now to the 13th floor and the number 13, <coughs> and the 13th letter, N, new. It stands for numismatic, which means coin collection, gold, capital gain. But it, but it stands for, more significantly, for the goddess Nemesis. She stands for wrath and vengeance. Thirteen is the number symbolizing all virtual reality, a contemporary synonym for all that is local, phenomena, constituting a holding to any objective causation. There are no particles to make up an atom of dirt. I name the whole of the progress of what is termed reason as epimethium. We all know about epimethius. We don't hear much about epimethius. Thirteen is that which has been arrived at finally through the latest scientific burrowing, now being hailed as retroactive causation. Science has retroactively mesmerized an infinitude of number into an infinitely, infinitely finite mathematics and have come up with an inflation that precipitated a big bang. In our very early Tamira was kept conceptualized as, which in early Tamira was captured, uh, conceptualized as the rupture of the perfection of the absolute. That precipitated the primordial scission. Tamira had also a beginning which was conceptualized as the absolute perfect one and was affectionately named the netter nun, N-U-N. She was non-local reality that the Bible and or Torah called chaos and all night and the darkness on the face of the deep. That darkness is manifest in our present blindness and ignorance as to just how reality can be what it is. Tum, T-U-M, rose up out of none, the rupture. None became at once new, and you, and un, you, nemesis. Remember, that the nemesis, that's, that's in the fifth century AD, we're speaking about 3000 BC. What the Tumira, what the Tumirans call the primordial scission is you and un, none, rupture, in him, polarity. wherein all that exists is in opposition. Time and the three dimensions of space, gravity and the three atomic forces. Thirteen is symbolically the one becoming three, as in God in three persons. The most profound nature of the number 13 is camouflaged in the name Hermes Trismegistus, meaning the letter Toph roar of our third house. Toth is Tuhuki, the ibis-headed netter. The Greeks thought Toth to be Trismegistus, three times greater than their Hermes, messenger of the gods and Zeus's favorite son. It also exemplifies Hermes as at once a thief. He steals ideas, a trickster, very tricky in securing information, and third, a magician. Inventor, alchemist, necromancer, creator of language, writing, mathematics, and whatever. All avenues of communication. The one is what the three seems to be, yet is not. Am I going too far afield? 
Any questions of thus far? No? Keep going. 13 is the form of the number 4. The primordial scission is the number 4, as with the symbolic primordial quadruplets, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. In Greece, it was Castor and Pollux, Helen and Clytemnestra, partially by Zeus as a swan, partially by Tyndarius. Remember the Titan Atlas? Zeus spared Atlas to hold up the four corners of the world. It is not far-fetched to say the four quarters of the zodiac. The hope in four is that it is also, the hope in four is that it is also the mystic number 22. But 22 is never four. The primordial scission, scission is primarily the number 11. And I have 11. And the way this and what is so strange that I wind up with 13 charts tonight, I have 12. Now when we get into this 11, this is what just sort of blew me away. I wasn't ready for how this evolved. The 11th house of the zodiac has as its symbol the waters above and beneath the firmament. The sign of Aquarius as we know it. Polarity again in the house of the fixed air sign. Fixed air sign. The number 11 and the 11th letter of the alphabet is the inverted V, lambda, which stands for locus, word, and the meaning behind the word. Lambda was the letter affixed to homosexuals in Nazi Germany to identify them for the most torturous indignities. Just where did 11, lambda, originate as the symbol for gay liberation? Now, some people have said it was a triangle, but the, the inverted lambda sign can look triangular. The dual Neru of our 11th house is the Netter Nekebit, the vulture, fertilized by the wind and ruler of the right side of the brain. The other is the Netter Ajit, the serpent that moves along the ground eating dirt in its linear progress. It rules the left side of the brain, and the Neteru Nekebit, the vulture, and Ajit, the serpent, constitute one of the pharaoh's crowns in Demura. There are connections here that I hope you're making because words and our communication is what I found is so unable, at least for me, Elena, I'm good with line and color, but with words and trying to, to structure an idea and I write and rewrite and to get this linear type of communication when I don't think that way. I, I, I'm fertilized by the vulture, the wind. I'm not prone to go along linearly and communicate word by word. But evidently, I've got to do it for some reason, because here I am. <laughs> Alpha to Omega, all are numbers in the play of Gematria. Number is all. All is and should now seem synonymous with reality, and seemingly it has been left back there in that one of the 13. That symbolic logic that is grounded in the construction of the Greek alphabet did not seem to be lost on the psychic mode engendered in the name of naming of many of the aspects of the quantum. For most are drawn on the same logic. As early as 1894, the first letter of the alphabet was employed as the name of the alpha, of the enigmatic quantum, the alpha rays, to be shortly followed by the beta rays. Then in 1895, that 22nd letter, <coughs> chi x, became the x-ray that penetrates the number 22. Then followed the third letter, gamma, Years ago, and the Gamma Decay, that earth goddess Gaelic. Gamma as when the soil erodes and runs all forming the triangular delta, a triangle as the fourth number and letter. Why a triangle? Why is a triangle used for the number four? The triangle three is 
determine the triangle here as four, here is a major key to the Hermetic. That triangular fourth letter, delta, is now the name of a particle in the quantum sea. There are 24 letters, and they are all used. The Phi Maisons, to name a few, the Mu Muons is the number 12, Mu, and the 12th letter, which stands for Myth, Minoan, Mycenae. Myth, Minoan, and Mycenae, which we will try to see later how that ties in with the 12th house of the fishes, Pisces. There is the Sigma Neutrinos article. Sigma is the number 18 and 18th letter, and it stands for Sphinx. But the most elusive <coughs> particle of all, they named number 23, PSI, which stands for Psaltery, Psalms, and Psyche. But why did they add a J before the PHI? There are no Js in the Greek alphabet. No accident. There is Pythagoras to consider briefly. He learned in his 22 years of journey to Europe, measure, that number is all. That is not as physicists would have it, though. They would have it that Pythagoras said all things are numbers. Pythagoras had learned all too well in Tumera that number was sacred, as was all knowledge, and number was reserved for functions and principles, and certainly not things. Most all that he contributed to the Greek culture might see in the, we might see in the very name Hermes Trismegistus, the trick magic. Pythagoras cannot be blamed. That blame is part of the Hermetic tradition. Pythagoras, I understand, understand died tragically for the knowledge of the super implicate order of number he learned in Tamira and then revealed to the Greeks. Let's turn again to the number three and the third letter gamma, which stands for the earth goddess Gaia and her, her immaculately conceived son Uranus and consort or husband, and the first of the trans-Saturnian planets. Saturn is the Roman name for that Greek son of Uranus, namely that famous painting by Goya of Cronus devouring his children? Medically? Symbolic? Question. Who cares in a world of observed scientific facts? Fact. No myth, legend, history. Maybe. What is real is what we are asking. Uranus was and even now is the very same father and brother of Cronus, alias Saturn. Uranus is, is the father, brother of all the Titans. Uranus, ruler of that 11th house with the signia of those venerable waters above and below the firmament, and the fixed air sign with the primordial waters as its signia, hermetically significant. Yes, when we ask where and when and how did the 11th letter, lambda, become the symbol of gay liberation, Let's approach it this way. Uranus is castrated by his son, brother, Cronus. It is Saturn. But in Tumira, Cronus, Saturn, is set the twin brother of Osiris. Set, and, and I understand that Jehovah is the Hebrew name for Saturn, and Saturn is Satan in Muslim and Christian religion. Much as Set dismembered his brother Osiris, and Horus is sodomized by his uncle Set before the functions of the principles of reality, the great company of the gods. Horus, in turn, castrates his uncle Set. What is all this about? This is myth, legend, history. This is that history of the myth behind the legends of the myths that are the Jungian archetypes and as Kafka saw buried behind consciousness. We do not want to hear this kind of talk. That is part of the problem. We do not have the language to speak the truth. You know, that sickle 
that Father one-dimensional time carries at new years and creates three-dimensional space. For that is Cronus with the sickle that his mother gave well, from her from her. Gaia brings her immaculately conceived <coughs> son and husband Uranus from Ur. Ur, the seat of the mother goddess Urania in Anatolia, and establishes the matrilineal capital at Kalapuya. History, legend, myth, or is it just the plain truth? Is Gaia that same Urania? How does the element Uranium fit? that has turned the rational and scientific <coughs> world topsy-turvy with all its split atoms, subnuclear forces, isotopes, the microcosm, and the awesome quantum. What are we alluding to here were not the ramifications of primitives. They saw the mystical ramifications of functions and their principles more scientifically than we seem to be able to. Myth legend history. Myths are legends warmed over and served up as history. Which of our facts will be viewed as too incomprehensible to be more than legends, but merely myths in the next millennium? Will we be considered too capitalistic to be more than myth? History is a linear side view of what appears like a quantum particle. Regardless of how it looks, it is still a wave <clears throat> which is where the truth lies, in the myths hiding the legends buried in the history of consciously unaware or awareness. Time does not permit us to go into much of the history of Olympian Zeus and that virgin goddess Nemesis. We might ask, how does Nemesis, wrath and vengeance, and gold collecting connect with Ur, Urania, Uranus, and Uranium in Eleven? Waters above and beneath the firmament and the number 14 and 14th Sigma KSI, which stands for foreign, strange, fear of the unknown or stranger. 14.5, it also stands for guests and the implications of post hospitable, hospital, and hospice. That fabled myth behind the unlucky number 13. Nemesis turned into a goose to escape the lechery of Zeus. No problem for Zeus, he changed into one of his many animal persona disguises. Now it is a goose. And Zeus, as goose, ravaged Nemesis. Then, as a swan, he proceeded to ravage Leda, instrumental in establishing the Dioscorium, quadruplets in Greece. Just what is Zeus really craving? The symbolic implications of the abduction of Europa as a Nelly bull. Europa's brother, Cadmus, is sent to find her by their brother, by their father, Agenor, king of Phoenicia, taking along 16 of those Gematria Greek siglia or letters. The message from the gods seems to speak through the Hermetic, number and astrology. Polarity is mythology. Facts, at best, are legendary. And history is hell. Now, for the 14th gnome of Upper Tumira, named Kemenu. Kemenu was the seat of the real Hermes, the ibis headed top. The Greeks renamed Kemenu Hermopolis Major, the origin of the Hermopolitan mystery. It is here that the primordial scission of Nun is realized in the new of Kemenu and its capital, An. New An. New means gold from Nubia. An, the original Delta port, and where it was the original goose that rose up out of the hillock of eternity when Tom rose up in Nun, rupturing the absolute one. You see how incredibly this stuff is all woven in there, but it's all out there. We don't know this stuff. We don't learn this stuff. We shouldn't know this stuff because it gives us individuality, which is shunned upon these days. Mm -hmm. Are you speaking ironically? I'm not. I didn't. I didn't get your communication just now. I like. I 
Like, yeah, uh, ironically, I am. Yeah. We so they're saying we should. Somebody's saying we shouldn't know these yeah, things because yeah. I feel that there is a strong factor in keeping us ignorant. I uh, I think I haven't even touched on UFOs, and I won't touch on UFOs. Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> Who said, oh, come on? <laughs> oh, no, I don't have time. Ah, okay, the myth goes that, let's see, three, nine, three, three, three. The myth goes that as an eagle, Zeus abducted the beautiful shepherd boy, son of Troyus, king of Troy. The shepherd prince was Ganymede, whom Zeus made his cupbearer on Olympus. Ganymede was the great uncle of Paris. That was the major cause of the Battle of Troy. Paris was implicated, but Helen was never in Troy. Helen's presence was a necessary poetic fabrication of Homer. Otherwise, the truth of the matter, as even tonight is difficult to believe, the abductor of Ganymede was not Zeus, but his friend, the king of Phrygia, the neighboring province of Troy. The king was Tantalus, who was exiled to Thrace for the act. As a former king, he proceeded to lead the Dorian invasion into Greece. All of these Dorians were the former virile boys bartered to the warlords of matured exiles in Thrace as their paramours, for there were no women there. We were in the time of matriarchy. It was the time of matriarchy. Huh. In their advance into Attica, they pillaged, burned, raped, and murdered. It was Tantalus who establishes the Mycenaeans on the Peloponnesus, named after his son, Pelops. Much as Phoenicia was the son of Agenor and brother of Europa and Cadmus, source of our Gematria this evening. Zeus, Ganymede, Tantalus. We spoke early, and I wanted to work this in here, and I, I will real quick. Tantalus gave, I mean, there's the, the big story that Tantalus gave a big banquet when he got set up in the Peloponnesus for the gods. And he invited all the gods, and they all came. And when uh, Tantalus went to his larder, it wasn't sufficient to feed all of the gods. So what did he do? He chopped up his son Pelops and put Pelops in the stew and served it up to the gods. But the gods aren't dumb, principles and functions. But we're in Egypt now, we're in rationality. So we're not thinking of this. What, what is going on in this Egyptian mind? And they say that the gods were created by Homer. He pulled them all together and, and, and pasted them up there. But anyhow, the gods saw it. And they were appalled, except poor Demeter. Demeter had just lost her daughter, Penelope. She was ravaged by Zeus's other brother, Poseidon. And so she didn't know that she was eating the shoulder of Pelops. So when they got all their parts and put them back into the stew, and they made it over again, poor Dem uh, Demeter, she put in, a, I think it was a gold shoulder to replace what she had eaten. You know, this sounds like myth, but it's boggling when you see, when you pull the curtain of myth back and say, that's where the truth is. It's behind the myth. It isn't in the fake, it isn't in history. That's where it is. And that's why we're gathered here tonight and other nights at Theosophical Society is because we are aware, we've been sensitized that the truth or reality is out there and it's touchable. And I think everybody that's come here has touched it. And that's almost traitorous to dialectical materialism, alias capitalism, the two faces of Janus. So when they got all the stuff back in the soup, they pulled out Pelops. And Pelops was so gorgeous that Zeus's brother Poseidon took off with his mighty stallions and captured Pelops and took him away. There we have it again. And basically what the whole system is, is this primordial scission tearing across a way, male, female, north, south, east, west, yes, no, up, down. And 
the marriage contract to bring the family, husband and wife together. It doesn't do it. And we're seeing, we're faced with this today. When we're seeing families broken up and torn apart, there are factors moving in the world beyond us. And, and what is pulling these things apart? Because it's illusion. And that's the hard thing to see, that reality is not local. That is absolute now. That is scientifically actually the most perfect equation to ever John Stuart Bell, uh, physicist, psychotron in Switzerland, Southern Switzerland. So, so, uh, here we have myth, legend, and history woven together. Once again, the number 12 and the 12th letter of our gematrix is U, M, which stands for myth, Menon, Mycenae. Abstractly, we can see the involvement of the 12 houses of the zodiac implicating all mankind. Now to let 12 catapult us into the number 18, sigma. Sigma stands for synthesis and the sphinx. With the number six and 12, the number 18, the sacred number of the netter Isis, ruler of my Tumirian sixth house, the house of mutable eternal life. Think about it. Mutable eternal life. The netter Isis is the virgin mother of the thrice immaculately conceived ruler of my fifth house. The hawk netter, Horus, divine principle love. And as the hawk ascends out of sight, I have read that gold and greed were the signs of Sodom and Gomorrah. Five was the mystic secret number of the Pythagorean Brotherhood. The fifth letter is, and the number five is Epsilon, and it stands for, I've discovered it, Eureka. The number six, the sixth letter of our gematric is Z, Zeta, which no less stands for Zeus. And equally as well, Zeta stands for Zeu, from which we get the Greek word Zodiacus, and that's our word Zodiac, with its 11 animal forms and the scale mock. And what is so strange? How I don't have the scale mock here, and I have the 11. I saw, I saw a Libra, you know. You know, I mean, these things happen. You know, what it, the, the, oh, I, I was thinking a very bold expression. <laughs> I'm sorry, I could twist it out there. Okay. So, truth, the principle, and justice is function. In the way, in the balance, the heart against the peacock feather symbol of mind. The scale is the number seven. I trust I haven't lost you completely with my tapestry weaving. Where the colors, lines, and shading of the warp and web are not too naturalistic, but actually <coughs> abstract, like reality. I hope I'm speaking to the Hermetic, as well as that faithful number 666. Though many have tried, words do not have the voice. Just a herm or two of those enigmatic signposts of Toth. We must not forget that master of it all, Tehuti, the Ibis Eddy principle, manifestation of mind through co cosmic consciousness, to the heavens and the serpent in the sky, to man. New 12, myth, Menon, Mycenae, plus six, Zeta, Zeus, Zu, equals all mankind. Equals six, 18, which means synthesis and the sphinx, man. The putting together. 666, ignoramously called the mark of the beast, and Antichrist is part of the cover up. How did the CIA and Pentagon get here? The three sixes add to the prophetic number 18 sphinx. Synthesis 18 equals 9. And the ninth letter is the smallest bit, iota, vanishing. Figuratively or literally, there is no truth in 666. The number is synthesis, and a or is it the sphinx synthesis? I think that's a trick. Here we take a quantum leap. In no way am I an 
astrologer, nor am I a numerologist. I have a few blinding insights, but one thing I do know as certain as my name is a fact, as well as anything else that is factual, numerology is that very stone with astrology that the builders of the scientific method rejected from the beginning of rationalism. That is quickly becoming, that is quickly becoming, and even now is the cornerstone of what is about as scientific as you can get if science is mesmerized by the route, the root, it is the, it is the cornerstone of what is about as scientific as you can get if science is mesmer, mesmerized by the root of the snake and ignores the flight of the vulture. Truth is not to be found in the dirt of materialism, but in the breeze or the wafting of the wind with a perspicacity that illumines the way. I like to think of myself as an artist, then. and the earliest recall of what I learned in art classes was called the relationship of figure to ground. The figure versus the ground around the figure. The object in the three-dimensional space. The object is in. Then I read, I think it was by the physicist Niels Bohr, who stated that the atom is like a solar system with a nucleus of neutrons and protons with satellites of electrons in orbit around the nuclear sun. Well, and whatever. I chose to receive a master's degree in the liberal arts from Johns Hopkins University and proceeded to spend the next 14 years, seven days a week, 10 hours a day, working in my studio gallery installation, attempting to create an installation wherein the viewer moving through this, it, moving through his own space, experiences other spaces. The artist's works I use, the artist's works I use are to create the viewer's recall of those other unconscious associations to create an unconscious fifth dimensional actuality, which I think of as the fifth density. Not the fifth dimensional, but the fifth density. I'll explain that a bit. The viewer has legendary objects experiencing myths emanating from that first density of the empathy or reality we call the fifth dimension. When Archibald Weir, a physicist, extraordinary stresses, when there really are no, when there really are no dimensions at all, that's a physicist that says that. He says we feed into the computer from one dimension, three dimension, five dimension, seven dimension, eleven dimensions. It goes to eleven dimensions. And he said, when there really are no dimensions at all. I was not for a moment aware of deliberately creating this installation. My deliberation was that there would not be any self-expression. It all began to emerge after three weeks off in January 1979, but I remained ignorant of what I was doing by numerologists and foreigners. I don't know whether that's clear. I was told what I was doing by numerologists and, and farmers from Europe. January 1979, in some fantastic way, presented a most incredible voyage up the Nile with my wife, Sally. There, somehow, I learned, while standing on the roof of the temple, after a dendron. No, no, the atom is not like a solar system. Much too rational and predominant stirred in my brain. I, know, I had no idea what it all meant then. Returning to America, I was beset by the Heisenberg theory, the particle wave simultaneity that quickened that early acquaintance with figure-ground relationship. The particle is such that only when observed does it virtually appear as expected. But when the scrutiny is over, the particle is nothing but its true self, a wave. This was all strong, strung together in a rather schizoid rumination to me. I kept coming across a quote during the early 70s that part that, I quote, the best kept secret in the scientific community is that scientists had lost touch with reality. Why? Well, in 1932, the eminent mathematician, 1932, John von Neumann published his definitive analysis of quantum theory in which the world is described as non-classical. It is all quantum stuff. 
The world cannot be made of ordinary objects that possess dynamic attributes of their own, like you and I, and the billions like us, and all the world around us. All objects or things are some form of projections. I suggest that the most likely projector is what has been labeled the zodiacus. Now, a giant step to 1964 and John Stuart Bell, Irish, even though his middle name may be Scottish, Bell was and now perhaps still is the physicist at the cyclotron at CERN, Switzerland. While on vacation in 1964, he explored by Newman's proof, which had caused physicists to reject reality altogether in favor of what they have called a neorealism. Local phenomena as a classical satisfactory reality, thus the neorealism. This is what gave rise to what was published in the 70s as science has lost touch with reality. Not much wonder we die serves us right for our origin. The Bell theorem and the consequent many God, many proofs has returned reality to the absolute point burning once again. Or what physicist David Dawn has called the super implicate. That is one word, super implicate order, as opposed to the explicit four-dimensional order of that neorealism in which we appear to exist. The subtle and often auspicious confusion, forgetfulness, loss of equilibrium, usually reserved for the elderly, now experienced by the young, the absolute has returned with apologies. Reality is non-local. That leaves us once again with that stone that there was rejected back there in summer astrology. Astrology contains all the signposts to some explored way of getting out of here. The stone the builders rejected was Titanic. The Titans, those giants, remember them? A rundown, the number three and third letter of the Greek alphabet is G gamma. It stands for the matrilineal earth goddess Gaia. Here's where my skeptics Skeptistic skepticism danders, dander gets up. The two magazines that appeared simultaneously in the fall of 1977, when those scientific quotes by scientists losing touch with reality hit the skeptic fans. Volume 1, number 1, 1977, the first issue of the Skeptical Inquirer magazine hit the subscription boards. Simultaneously, the online magazine, Volume 1, number 1, 1977, hits the same subscription service. Just one year after the 1976 bicentennial year of the gross national product. What were they they afraid of? Who financed these magazines and why? Some of what the Pentagon Black Money is all about. The fall issue of the Skeptical Inquirer 1992 has an article about this third letter, Gamma, Gaia. Its title goes, Gaia Without Mysticism. Then winter 99, it hits the crop circle, hypothesis and hoopla. The Army Engineer Corps of England could not have successfully made those crop circles, and yet they are accredited by the Skeptical Inquirer to four pranksters. Then the famous astrological Mars effect. Anybody heard of the astrological Mars effect? You might get it and read about it. It's, it's proof that a certain group of star athletes, something like a thousand around the world, all had a certain configuration, and they're trying to prove that that's a article, Astrological Mars Attack. Then the astrological roots of astrophysics. Then in the summer of 93, the right hemisphere of the brain is attacked as an esoteric closet. And then spring 94, there is the article called Anti-Science Threat by Paul Kurtz. In the winter of 94, just past, there is another article by Paul Kurtz called The New Skepticism. Hoopla for nearly 20 years now, and these just mark there are absurdities of occultism granted that may well deserve skepticism. But the direct motive for these magazines with articles much more damaging to freedom is a direct disclaimer of any individual's <coughs> rights or justification for perspicacious expression. Several articles are headlined by making jokes and defamations of artists, sculptors, and architects, wherein any hitherto scholarly use of pi the 16th letter and the irrational function used as the measuring ratio of the circumference of the circle. Then there is phi, pi, phi, I mean, pi, phi, the 21st letter, 
and the function that all artisan significance use and known as the golden section, I use by in all my works. These right hemispheric, mythopoetic, esoteric, metaphysical brain functions being attacked by the Epimetheans give great credence to the fast approaching days when Pluto goes staggering dubiously into the ninth house dominance of Zeus, alias Jupiter, and turns the hourglass upside down. Almost finished. Then there's the 23rd side. It stands for Psyche, Psaltery, and Psalms. All three of these are all put down by separate articles in Skeptical Spark. A lot of defamation has been made in the past 18 years. What is so frightening to those without imagination or person casting vision or intu intuition? Because they lack precisely man's raison d'etre, or what are they determined to cover up? What is left for skeptics? The physicist John Archibald Weir hit it on the head with his disclaimer that the only plausible reason for man's existence is for a retroactive causation. We might assume that with the Einstein special and general laws of relativity, the splitting of the atom, and the Big Bang theorem, the quantum field theory, reality is not local, the snakes are out of touch trying to find a raison d'etre. Science has created our reason for existing. They go back in their scientific method. This is the way of the Epimetheans as opposed to Prometheus. And I'll show you, uh, I don't know whether I get it in here or not, but uh, to, to make it short, uh, the story is when the Olympians came in to control at uh, Mount Olympus, they overthrew the Titans and they saved Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Atlas. Prometheus is chained as far away from Greek, Greece in a rock in the Caucasus. Caucasus means cow crossing, and that is primarily due to Io, I-O, the Ionian Sea, the Ion Ionian coast of Anatolia. Now, that implies to me, we hear very little of Epimetheus. Why? Epimetheus, we, we know Prometheus bound by Aeschylus' play. We know the other two plays of that trilogy are laws. <coughs> Epimetheus is the root of rationalism, logical positivism. It's afterthought. Epimetheus is afterthought. Zeus changed forethought. Prometheus is forethought chained out there as far away from Greece as they could get him in the Caucasus. But that is out there in the origin of the matriarch. Karapoyuk is the, the great um, matriarch of capital. And they expounded all the male babies that had any virility. And they kept the, the male babies that might produce females. And therefore, Thrace was a mass of homosexuals, forced by the lack of any female companions. So, so just how much of this is real, or true, or myth, or fact? They are so tied together. But if reality is non-local, uh, what is the difference between myth, legend, and history? What do you mean when you say reality is not local? Well, I don't know. I just want you to help me know. Well, the thing, it, it's very difficult. That's what this whole, it's very difficult to explain. If reality is not local, we don't have the language to express reality. Are you telling me that you can't answer my question? When you say that reality is non local, you cannot tell me what that meant. Well, yes, I know what it means. Well, can but I, can, I, I find what I read in the beginning in microcosm, we don't have the language. Our language is of the materialistic, the technical. I, you I, can't help me know what that meant. I think I can answer it for you. Go ahead. Uh, I can answer it with the words of Gertrude Stein when she was talking about Oakland, California. She said, there is no here, here. <laughs> well, Only there. That's I have a completely yeah. different point of view. <laughs> and I believe that God is within. And that's all that's in my mind. I'm not speaking to God at all. I know you're not. I'm not, I, I, want to, I deliberately try to stay away from it. When I use the fundamentalist statement of uh, the great company of the gods, but the, though that great company of the gods to the historians included animal worship. The Egyptians were the first to believe in one god. 
And then it, we get into this idea of when did Moses leave Egypt, which is a great, great controversy. The accepted historical view is absolutely wrong. Moses did not leave in the Ramses. Moses left at, with, with the time of the Hyksos back at the beginning of the 18th dynasty when we open with the word, the early, the early pharaohs, Amos. Amos means son, I think. Amos is the first king. Then we have Thutmosis. Thoth, Thut is Thothmos. The son of Thoth is what it means. So when you speak to reality being non-local, we don't want to give up our presence, you see. Our what? Our presence, our existence. Yes. But we're going to die because we got to get out of here because we didn't come in, because we're illusion. Uh, to me, the life and death uh, bit is what we're trying to do something with. And that's what uh, Archibald Wheeler called retroactive causation. We are retroactively create because here we are, but existence isn't life. You see, that's the thing. I have uh, life here is, is icy. Is the symbol, the number six. It's the implicit. For instance, if you want to understand the nature of reality, you have to go back through symbols. I don't want to do it intellectually. I completely abhor that. And there's something that I'm having trouble with listening to you, and that's that you say that communication is impossible or nearly impossible because words aren't the medium, the appropriate medium for communication to happen. And all I can tell you is when I read the body of God Gita, which means the song of God, or when I read A Course in Miracles, or when I read the Sermon on the, on the Mount in the Bible, I know exactly, I think, what the teachers are saying. And I want to say that it can be communicated. Oh, I look. It, it can be communicated, but how? In words? Yes. That the words can lead us to the point of experience. Oh, all right, but the words will not do it. You have to be receptive. And that, well, that, that distinguishes you and, and gives you this, this, this heightened sense of spirituality, which is as, as good as you can achieve, I think. So I'm not, I'm not denigrating that at all. I, my story here is to set straight the symbolism that is all that exists. And the Egyptians called the Grand of the Nile a grand symbolic. It is in the image and likeness of heaven. It's translated that the heaven was in the image and likeness of the not. Everything gets twisted and has gotten twisted around with history because they had myths woven in here. The story I was giving you about Zeus when he gets rid of the there is just so much here. Now, to say it's intellectualized. Yeah. Because you've got to get it out of the way. You have to pull that theater. I didn't go into Theta is the letter which means theater and thespis. We are all actors. Now, if you choose to play and wish to play a good, honest, giving man, as opposed to somebody else who's a greedy person that's seeking out, they're all part of the theater. I don't wish to play it. I wish to genuinely be it. But how could we have, normally we have the lecture, we allow the lecture oh, to finish. Okay. Then we have announcements, and then we have discussion. OK, well, that's it. Are you, are you what Well, you? I was going to put, I had some afterthoughts, but I, that's not necessary. I think it, the time is spent. So, so. so. so as I just said, we'll be having a discussion later. Uh, well, the very question that you're proposing is going into each individual's ear, and the two hemispheres of the brain, this linear left hemisphere, and this mythopoetic, this vulture, uh, aspiring to great ideas, they're working conjointly over a bridge, and they're putting the words of what you're saying that is things are linear and factual and rational. We have well, gone. Wait a wait a second. Yeah, you, you say humans are here. History is retroactive. I, what, how, how did you put that? Oh, that's that that's very, a, it's very easy. easy. That's beautiful. So that, if you can grasp that, easy. but that makes sense though it, with regard to the to the scientist who's measuring the particle, because without scientists, the particle's not there. 
right? So in essence, they're creating a, a, a raison d'etre. So in essence, we're doing the same thing, right? Yeah, but the thing is, get the idea, the creation, we are the creators. And specifically, right, the physicist is creating our existence. Right. Because there is no prehistory back there. And well, this is what is so, you know, you're asking me to put into words what I've struggled to try to get here in some linear manner to communicate. I don't know. I mean, did, did I lose, lose you? Where, where, did yeah. I come across? Doesn't that drive you to solipsism, though? I mean, ultimately, aren't we all the creators? And this could be all, this whole thing. No, I, don't, I, don't, I used to believe or go with solipsism. We have to get rid of it. We have to get rid Because we've got to change our vocabulary. And we don't have the vocabulary because we've been conditioned and programmed in a certain manner of structure. Right now, I'm reading uh, literature that is not linear, that there's two or three subjects and two or three predicates, and it's beautiful to me. I present it to some English teacher, and they go, ours. That's ours. You see, they want it ours. linear. They want one subject, one predicate, and get on to the next sentence. The shorter the sentence is, the better. And, you know, Hemingway, you know, they love these little short things. Well, that's Mary's got the answer. Mary's got the answer. So yeah, Matt. Cornelius has the answer. This is oh, Cornelius. Cornelius. The question that I have is very much related to what you say. And that is that here on these pictures that you have, you've got the zodiac signs. Now, we are used to thinking of the archetypes of the zodiac signs as being the gods and goddesses of the Greco-Roman mythological pantheon. But you have used the metaru of the Egyptian pantheon, which is unfamiliar to us. And I, I would really appreciate it if you would tell us how you associate the Egyptian metaru with the different signs. Aries. I have Pluto ruling Aries. And I we discussed this, how uh, uh, Pluto, uh, Mars came to be here and Pluto elsewhere. I mean, there again, this is not, let, let's go here. Tom, I call Aries, and all of these are every man. In other words, these are all me, they're all you. Yes. Aries, to me, is dominion. Ta is the commander. But when he speaks, he speaks the words of Ta <coughs> through the voice of half, and when he, sp he speaks this, and the inspiration comes from Kapura, that is the, the soul and the inspiration. The inspiration comes, and this is the interesting thing of the four, and the association of the four is also 13, it's also 22, and it's the, the implication of Pythagoras number is all. So, it, it's, it's inspiring to me the way I wake up in the middle of the night and it's like I've dreamt this that I can't separate my dream from what I'm thinking and all of a sudden I'm aware I'm awake. And I was dreaming that and the connection between dream and an actual realizing a concept. You know, I, I went through a whole period in my life when I came to spirituality. I had, I had very severe uh, healing. If uh, healing is severe, I had very severe problems that I healed through Christian science. So I know how Christian science works and where it has its limits to certain people because they, they haven't released certain factors, what they are, what you put your finger on, I don't know. Now, I am not a practicing, uh, I am a practicing Christian scientist now, but I'm not, um, I'm not a fanatic about it. Because I'm, I'm, I've been stressed out too much. I've got too many interests. I am, I'm digging up hundred ton granite boulders down in Virginia, and I'm sculpting spaces out of the earth. Why am I doing this? Because I've done everything else. What else am I going to do? Well, what you've got to do right now is tell me which of the natural. <laughs> 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 
Okay, when for instance, these move along, we notice the way I have 11 here. I've seen that 11, and then I realized this before I got into this other one. This is what was so astounding to me because I saw this sign when I did this and push this sign of Aquarius. You all know the sign of Aquarius. <coughs> this is water, and it also is affiliated with the idea of man in, in um, Egypt. So this is in the standard hor horoscope and, and the sign of Aquarius, the waters above and below the firmament. What constitutes the firmament? What is the firmament, and what is the waters above and below? Is the, is the pulling apart? Is what? And when this is pulled apart, you get the 12 and the 10. Now, the interesting thing to me, the reason why this is here primarily, here you have 11 and 12 and 10 are 22, and 11 is the primal 33, which is the. No, but I, I'm fascinated by the figures, the personifications, and you've got, a, in most of them, you have divine figures. No, you have principles. And I, I wondered, for instance, you've got a, a bluish figure. Yeah. You've usually got one large figure and then two supporting figures. But the just let's talk about the main figures. The the kind of angelic figure in in uh, Pisces. What what would that be? What which of the nether rooms would that represent to you? Or, or is it just a, a I mean what what does it mean to you that that figure? If it doesn't have a name. Some of them have names like the Osiris and Isis. It doesn't, they don't have names. Well, I, have I, I call this, the rulers here is, is Nut and Gev. Oh, okay. Nut is the heavens and Gev the earth. Okay. So this is duality. This is a dual time. But let me go, since I'm here, this gives dominion. It's the head. This is the spirit. This, the Taurus is usually called a fixed earth sign. Not so here. This is spirit, the only substance, not fixed earth. This is mind, and the four, this is soul, and five is love, five is love, and six is life, and not existence, this is life, as in eternal love, as in divine love, eternal life, divine love, and then the seven is mock, which is truth and justice, and then the eighth is uh, regeneration, and nine is transformation, and 10 is transmutation. And this is the primordial scission, and the every man here, actually in Pisces, is like 12 is across from six in the Virgin, and, and the Christ image there is implicated in, uh, um, in the church in Florence, the Monte, which is a fabulous implication of that. But the, uh, Does that you 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 forced my hand yeah, a little bit of how these came about? <laughs> is when I came back from Egypt, uh, I need something in my whole uh, installation relative to Egypt. So I sit down, sit down, and put these together out of uh, out of nowhere. And so now I'm forced to say what they mean. <laughs> and, and you know what? This is, uh, you know, it's not laughable. The thing is, they mean something that I wasn't ready for. So here is what you're saying. I These, by the way, let me tell you, I'll, I'll put this bit in here. Yesterday we sat down with the lawyers to get um, the Arctic Refikir Recordi in Milan has, is a big publishing company since 1807, and they publish music, one of the best uh, publishers of music in the world, I understand. All orchestras buy their, their scores from there. But they are the finest reproducers of prints. So they, they are going to be producing. So we're negotiating a contract. They already were signing for these, for these first two. And that is on um, pending now. They're waiting, I have transparencies. They'll put those transparencies into a computer. The computer breaks them up. 
and right now is just how much freedom we want to get of them only for reproducing these. I think it's, what's the size, Sally? What's the size of the print? They're in, in centimeters. But it's, they're going to be almost the size of the originals, but they're going to print. But they'll be in a poster form. And like I'm requesting that my name must be on there. Now here it is, my name. Basically, I'm going along with this to publicize my name throughout the world so the rest of the art I've done is going to be valuable because people buy the name. They don't buy the art, they buy the name. You know? So you have to make your name. And that's, yeah. Speaking of that, are, are, are you writing the book or did you write the yes. book? No, I'm working on it. When's that going to be out? Uh, and what's the title? Uh, Dwellers on the 13th. That's the name of the book? No. Okay. okay, Grand Sibai. But it will have my other works in it. So it that's what I was thinking. Yeah. But, it, but I'll give you an idea of how it goes. The, the, the first chapter in the book is chapter 13. But <laughs> chapter 13 is not in the table of contents. The table of contents is in chapter 13. But the first chapter in the table of contents is chapter 11. And then it goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 12. Mm -hmm. And 12 is the, the grand union of all. And then I go to chapter 18. That's, I can't wait to dip it. It's like Tristan Shandy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. It seems to me you've been like an alchemist, you know, in the sense that you're, you're, you're taking this, the knowledge of the ancient, which I consider like part of the, the veil of the, the school of mysticism, and have uh, incorporated all on a linear visual level, but it's it's all like you said, symbolic. It's all there, but you you, you have to be able to understand, you know, experience to to actually see it. Well, you know, it's coming out. You see, how Mary's been after me to get, and I have people that are soul these to. They want to know what they're about. Sure, I don't know what they're about. You know, but it's coming. And, and this is what is intriguing. But let me drop this in here. Do you know who, strangely enough, who I've sold the most of these to? The two factors. One, the, the, the sign of the zodiac that you would least expect to buy them. I have sold more to Capricorn. Capricorns. And the reason why <laughs> Capricorns like, like them, they yeah. love the structure. The way that I've overlaid and I've made them work in a unit but they're a great appreciation appreciators of history. A great, you know, they, they yeah. may not. Are you a Capricorn? No, but I know, uh, you know. Maybe they see them as an investment. As an investment, because they're very uh, <laughs> young. Uh, no, uh, not, not a photograph. Well, and no, the yeah. others are architects. <laughs> architects <laughs> level. But they're interested in structure, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Capricorns are usually engineers, and they're very methodical. Actually, the lawyer we got is a, is a Capricorn. And he's fascinated by this, so he's glad. So it's the very the money man. Capricorn are very um, they they yeah. uh, entrepreneurs, financiers, yeah, financiers, right? Uh, May I say yeah. something? We have the money. Many, there. Many people well, believe that the pyramids were built by extraterrestrials. I believe it too. And, oh, partially. Um, if you do, we don't have time to go into that. But can I just that. say go ahead, go ahead. that also that the pharaohs were not human, they were divine. So how could we presume to understand what they did? See, here is the connection. There was a time before the coming of rationalism that man was much more spiritual. There were barbaric uh, uh, primitives in the woods, but there was an enlightenment that they were not tied to gravity. To me, gravity means grave. It means this birth and death, born into this this traumatic thing that I call hell. Third eye. They have hmm? the third eye. It's very active. They levitate. And we are we're the ones who are called. You know, there's no end to this. It's, this is the beauty of it. There's no end. We could. Yeah. We could. This could go. Yes, there is. <laughs> 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 it's called singularity. At a little moment when we only can express our gratitude to less for what he's done this evening. And I'm sure Les would be willing to stay on a little longer for those people who don't wish to leave now, but who would like to ask him more about it. But that'll go on all night. No, <laughs> uh, you've never 
fully resolve the uh, <coughs> reality is not local. Mm -hmm. I think there are two ways of resolving it. One is Heraclitus, and you can never step in the same river even once. When, uh, when you say here, it's no longer here, it's gone, it's vanished. So there's a new uh, uh, atomic fabric in any given nanosecond. Or you can look at it in the sense of the newer physics of uh, Stephen Hawking's. When he speaks of singularities, if I can interpret for you what he means by those. You have two singularities at the beginning and end of time, and you have the expanse of the universes in betwixt them. What happens is you can interpret these two uh, ultimately condensed matrices of reality and fabric of stuff as at beginning and end, they are projectors. One is projecting it, the other is pulling it in. And we but are a projection. The is projection. Yes, exactly. And that could be a hologram. We don't know. That is projection. That is retroactive causation. It is, I, it is um, uh, John Archibald Weaver, who I mentioned, who named the black hole the black hole. Mm -hmm. But the thing that they, I received a no-no. And it is, there is no particle. You cannot say reality is non-local and accept a particle. You see, it's all in the way individually we accept it. What Hawking said is Hawking's problem. It isn't my problem. This is seeking out your own salvation. Then you and are, it, huh? Sir, then you are a syllogist. <laughs> well, good. If that's what it is, if you need labels, as long as I have a label, but I I'm think, not into reality. I so. think you might want to read Stuart Chase's book, The Tearing of Words. Because if we're going to communicate, we have to have equal reference for the same word. Now you're being a scientist. No, 